Welcome back. We've had the trauma of an exam. I do not have them. I do not have them graded yet, but I will get them graded either tonight or at the latest tomorrow. Um, I was, you know, the preliminary scores. I was disappointed. I like to see high grades. You know, I like to see. Well, yeah. Okay, so we're both disappointed. Um, so I'm going to be looking over in for class on Friday. I will go over the the most missed questions. But I did post the exam actually before it was done on Moodle and on OneNote, so you can see the solutions there. You know, while it's hot in your head, and we'll talk about them, like I said, on Friday. So we are starting a new section. I say starting a new section. You've done two reading assignments on this section. So you should be kind of up to speed on what I'm talking about. We're going to talk about temperature and heat today, primarily. So first, what are temperature and heat? Tell me what your understanding are of these two words. Okay, heat is a what? A basketball? <laughs> um, okay. Heat is a basketball team. That's a winner. It, it's not untrue, Randy. It's a transfer of energy. Oh, it's a energy. transfer of energy. That transfer of energy is an important thing. And you'll find that in some fields they use heat, I suppose, differently. I always have said wrong, but that's a little bit like, you know, I'm the official arbiter of what's right and what's wrong. I didn't see Jenna. Let me mark her as present. So heat is a transfer of energy. Now we've already learned of a type of transfer of energy. What's the type of type of transfer of energy we've learned about previously? Well, when we've changed it from potential to kinetic, what were we doing? Yeah, but what, what did we call that? Uh, work. Work. <laughs> Somebody over here is feeling really good about something. So work was a transfer of energy. Heat is a transfer of energy. They're similar things. What's the difference in the two then? Work had force times motion parallel to that force. Heat is a transfer of energy without <clears throat> any physical change like that. So heat is a direct transfer. What about temperature? What does temperature mean? I mean, as far as we know, temperature, hot is hot, cold is not. And that's where most people end. Now, what we will learn in our lecture on, should be on Friday, is what we call the kinetic theory of gases. And the kinetic theory of gases says that temperature is a measurement proportional to, and the proportionality depends on the material, but it's a measurement proportional to the average kinetic energy <laughs> of the molecules. So when we're doing what we call thermodynamics, thermodynamics has another name that is statistical physics. We're applying statistics to a large group of atoms. Take this room. It's filled with gas. How many molecules of gas are in this room? A lot. A lot. Okay, a lot. Good. Fair answer. It's going to be many, many moles, right? It's going to be billions times billions of molecules in this room. By the way, just a curiosity question. What's the primary component of air? Nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen gas. It's about 78 to 79% nitrogen gas. So when you're breathing, you're getting a lot of nitrogen, right? But we don't care about that. We care about the other 21% oxygen. Trace amounts of other things. Go ahead. Okay, so you can't track the kinetic energy and momentum you know, well, if you track the momentum and the position of every molecule, you know everything about it. Well, I said for molecule. Molecules could also be rotating. You need to know about rotation. Let's go with monatomic, just to make life easy. Monatomic molecules are single atoms of molecules. If we track the momentum and the position of every monatomic atom in this room, if they were all monatomic, we could exactly solve the physics problems. 
but nobody can calculate or track what's going on with billions times billions of molecules. So instead, we're relying on statistics. And so when we talk about temperature, it's basically a proxy for the average kinetic energy. It's not an equality. It's a proportionality. The proportionality varies. But it's telling us about the average kinetic energy. So if I have a single thing, like here I have cold water, ice cold. Here I have hot water, too hot to put my finger in. What's the fundamental difference between the water molecules in these two? One has more kinetic energy per molecule. This one here. Because those molecules are moving faster, they're bouncing off each other harder, what's that going to do to their spacing? Increase it. So this here should be a little bit bigger volume for the same mass than this one. Now, I didn't measure these out to be the same mass. So that's just a... So there's the difference in the two. Now, as, as you go deeper in physics, which probably none of you will, here's the technical definition. Whoops. The technical definition of temperature I believe is that partial derivative of U, which is the total internal energy with respect to entropy, holding volume and, and number of atoms constant. You do not need to write this down. Okay. It's not anything you would ever be expected to know, ever. That's the technical definition. That's even different than my, you know, the kinetic theory definition of proportional to average kinetic energy. And so because of this kind of bizarre definition, it turns out that when we go through the laws of thermodynamics, we have the first law. The first law says energy can't be created or destroyed. First law of thermodynamics. We have the second law. The second law says that every natural process occurs to, there's a lot of different ways. Um, the way we'll see today, so that heat flows from hot to cold. That's one statement of the second law. There's a lot of different variations on it. Then we have the third law, nothing can reach absolute zero. And then we have a fourth one that they only determined was necessary when they came to this sophisticated understanding of temperature. And so the fourth one, they don't call the fourth law of thermodynamics, they call it the zeroth law of thermodynamics because it's fundamental to all the rest. And the zeroth law says that if object A is in thermal equilibrium, object K, I better just use words that you understand right now. If temperature A equals temperature B, and temperature B equals temperature C, then temperature A equals temperature C. Come in, Yes, they all three equal each other. Yeah, if, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Then they're all temperatures. <clears throat> it seems really obvious, right? But when you got to that definition of temperature, all of a sudden it wasn't so obvious. And so that's why they made that the zero form. Okay, how do we measure temperature? Okay, so this young man has a thermometer in his mouth. What is going on? Uh, is it kind of like heat transfer from one object to another? Okay, his body is hot. And heat is going out of his body into that thermometer until it reaches equilibrium. So we have what we call thermal equilibrium. I'm actually covering topics that are going to make you go quick. These some slides coming up. Thermal equilibrium occurs when you have two objects in thermal contact. A lot of words I'm saying right here. Thermal contact means that they are able to exchange heat. So if we have two objects in thermal contact and no heat flows between them, then we call that thermal equilibrium. And when two things are in thermal equilibrium, they're at the same temperature because that second law says that if there are different temperatures, heat will flow from the hotter one to the colder one. So the second law, thermal equilibrium, thermal <coughs> contact, these are all tied together in that second law equation. So here, he has the thermometer under his tongue. We're going to get a sublingual temperature. And it's really uncomfortable under there. I hate that. And so it's going to heat up the thermometer. And inside that thermometer these days, it's just alcohol with some food coloring in it. So it's going to heat up that alcohol. And as that alcohol heats up, because the molecules are moving faster, bouncing off each other harder, 
they expand. And so you see the expansion in water going down the little tube and it's calibrated. So for this much expansion, it's this big a change in temperature. So that's how he's measuring his temperature. So what are we actually measuring? Ultimately, we're measuring the temperature of the alcohol. And so we have to get that alcohol at the boy's body temperature so we can determine what the boy's body temperature is. Okay, uh, I tried to change these all. Remember that talk I went to about effective teaching? They said, try not to have any animations, just have them flash up. So I tried to change them all, but apparently I forgot this one. If two objects are in thermal contact with one another long enough, they have the same temperature. That's the thermal equilibrium we talked about. So that's the beginning to the definition of temperature. If they have the same, if no heat flows, we have the same temperature, and that's thermal equilibrium. Like I said, I talked about this. And so the zeroth law of thermodynamics, if you write it out, you can write it as if temperature A equals temperature B and temperature B equals temperature C. If you say it in words, it's if object A is in thermal equilibrium with object B and object B is in thermal equilibrium with object C, then object A is in thermal equilibrium with object C. Those are the words for it. Okay, if I have two things in thermal contact, so if I take two things and make them touch, you know if I touch this, heat can flow, right? So if they touch, they're in thermal contact. If I bring my hand close, it still gets warm. So there's some heating even without contact. And we'll talk about the mechanisms for heat in a later lecture. But here they're in thermal contact. Heat will always flow from the hotter one to the colder one. Not the one with more total energy. Now, when I asked for the definition of heat, no one said the total energy, which is excellent. That's where I know I had a former colleague, a biology professor, and his textbook said that heat was the amount of thermal energy something had. Well, at least according to physicists, that's blatantly wrong. And so he was like, so you would say, you know, how much heat is there in Holmes Lake? And you would say what? I would say none, because an object can't possess heat. But heat is flowing always from the hotter to colder. Now let's take this and put it into a, a hypothetical situation. Let us suppose that you have a hot tub and you have a cold soda and that cold soda, the can, gets into the hot water. What direction does heat flow? From what to what? From the hot to the cold. So it goes from the hot tub water into your can. What if you then had the hot soda and you put the hot soda in a swimming pool full of cool water? What direction does heat flow? From the can to the pool. Okay, so that's real simple. Sometimes people get confused because what has more total thermal energy? Guys, if you add up the kinetic energy of all the molecules, what has more thermal energy? The can or the swimming pool? The swimming pool would have more total energy. But the can has the higher temperature, more energy per molecule. And it always flows from a higher energy per molecule, not the one with more energy. All right. If you add heat to an object, it will cause the molecules to move faster. And if they move faster, well, we have a name for that. We say that's increasing the average kinetic energy per molecule, hence increasing the temperature. So heat flows into something, its temperature goes up. Or conversely, if heat flows out, the temperature should go down. So heat temperature, definitely not the same. There's some symbols in this picture. I wrote down here Q is heat. Q is the symbol we use for heat. What was it on Friday? It was the flow rate. Now Q is the heat. So you have to be clear on what the symbols stand for based on the topic. This has M and C. M stands for mass still, thankfully. C stands for what we call the specific heat. You, if especially if you're studying for 
taking the MCAT, you probably have already seen this equation. The relationship between the change in temperature and the heat is Q equals MC delta T. So you have a mass of a substance. C is its specific heat, which tells you the relationship between putting in heat and the temperature change, and then change in temperature. A lot of times people abbreviate that as Q equals MCAT, which is why people preparing for the MCAT always know that one because it has a funny play on words. Temperature scales. Interesting. Temperature scales changed on May 20 of this year. Temperature definition is not the same. Practical outcomes to you and me still the same. So the first widely used temperature scale was that created by Gabrielle Fahrenheit in what, 1724? Yeah, 1724. And depending on which book you read, you will find different descriptions of how he did it. But the one that I had in graduate school said that he used the temperature of mixed ice with seawater from around his home at zero degrees Fahrenheit. And he used the body temperature of a bovine as 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so how many degrees were between these two calibration points? Uh, 68. Going from zero to 100. Oh, 100 degrees. I thought you said you measured uh, 70, 32. Right? No. Zero. <laughs> zero. Zero was the temperature. It, it was the temperature of freezing seawater, ice and seawater from his area. So that's basically the Fahrenheit scale. If you think about the calibration points, that's not the best scale. Because if you change the salinity of seawater, the freezing temperature changes. And your body temperature changes throughout the day. And if you get sick, it goes up because of high fighting infection. So it didn't have good reproducible endpoints. So it wasn't a great method of defining. Now we introduce Anders Celsius in 1742. So notice that was, what would that be, 18 years later? 18 years later, Anders Celsius, probably Anders, I, I really should know this because like me, he's a Swede. I don't think Horace Swedish, but big chunk. He came up with a temperature scale where he used the freezing point of pure water and the boiling point of pure water as his temperature um, calibration points. And still it was zero and 100, except for one thing. Most people do not know this, 100 degrees Celsius, well, 100 degrees in Anders Celsius' scale, was the temperature of freezing water. And zero degrees in Anders Celsius' scale was the temperature of boiling water. Now, something I read this morning said that it was changed the year before he died. What I've read otherwise was within one year after he died, it was changed. But that doesn't make sense to England, right? Because it's not what we do. Why doesn't it make sense scientifically? Because it still doesn't make sense scientifically. That's why it was flipped on its head after it died. If temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy, what's the minimum kinetic energy an object can have? Well, just, just think of a ball. What's the minimum kinetic energy a ball can have? Zero. What's the maximum kinetic energy a ball can have? Infinite. Infinite. So, it's what we would call a semi-infinite range. It goes from an, an absolute minimum to no maximum. And so having the scale, so your, your temperature that's proportional, or your kinetic energy that's proportional has absolute minimum, <coughs> should correspond to having a temperature with the absolute minimum. Not a temperature that turns out to have some random absolute maximum and then could go down. So that's why it makes sense, so now temperature is flipped. Okay, so just some more history. You will not be asked about the history of the scales. I tell you this because I think it's useful just for some knowledge and, and interest. The Celsius scale was not actually called the Celsius scale 
until what 1948 I think it is it was called the centigrade scale because it was 100 degrees between the reference points but in 1948 or whatever it is they changed the name to Celsius so when I was a child going to school now I wasn't going to school until the 70s when I came to America in 71 and my parents were interested. I was born back here. I got confused between centigrade and Celsius. I didn't know they were the same thing. Because it had been called centigrade and then was called Celsius. Our textbooks, some textbooks would use centigrade because you know you get 20-year-old textbooks. And some would use Celsius. Some six years after they changed the name from centigrade to Celsius, they took it off of the <laughs> centigrade scale. What does it mean to be centigrade? 100 degrees between your reference points is what it means. And so 0 to 100 is 100 degrees. Well, in the, the 1950s, like 1954 or so, they changed the reference point. So instead of the freezing temperature of water, it's what we call the triple point of water. The triple point of water is a specific temperature and pressure. So you can only get it one way. There's no multiple temperatures depend on pressure. Whereas the melting point depends on pressure, where you can have all three of the common phases, liquid, solid, and gas, coexist. So that's something that can be checked anywhere in the world if you lower the pressure and you get to the point where they all three coexist, you know that that's what turns out to be 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. So at that point, it changed from a centigrade scale to a 99.99. So centigrade is no longer accurate. This year, they changed everything. So technically, temperature is defined by Boltzmann's constant. It's not defined by measurements anymore. But they made the definition such that you still have absolute zero is zero kelvins or minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. And the triple point of water is still 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, or 273.16 kelvins. By the way, you might notice you don't say degrees when you use kelvins, but you do when you say Celsius or Fahrenheit. I don't know why. So that's a new change. You don't have to know that history or anything, but it's just kind of interesting to know some of the background, I believe. And I'll tell you, when I was your age, I could care less about history. <laughs> Now, the Celsius scale, if you go from freezing temperature to boiling temperature, that's a difference of 100 degrees Celsius still. With the Fahrenheit scale, as, as David mentioned, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The Fahrenheit scale is actually calibrated based on the Celsius scale. So everything dribbles down to the new calibration. The Fahrenheit technically changed its calibration when they changed the calibration for Kelvin's as well. But the Fahrenheit scale is fixed at a difference of 180 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as a difference of 100 degrees Celsius, which means each Fahrenheit degree is a smaller increase. So if you go from 68 Fahrenheit to 72 Fahrenheit, you've got a four degrees Fahrenheit, and you've only got up about two Celsius. Because that ratio, 180 over 100, that's nine over five, it's close to two. So based on that, we can do conversions between temperatures. Celsius temperature is, start with the Fahrenheit temperature, subtract 32, so you have the zeros matching, and then multiply by the five nines. Or to solve for Fahrenheit based on Celsius, you take the Celsius, multiply by 9 fifths, so you have the same change, and then you add 32 because of the zero offset. Those are, of course, the same equation, just one solve for Fahrenheit and one for Celsius. So for lab next week, you're going to be having to do this calculation. It's, it's simple math. You're going to be given the equations, just you need to be able to do it. Both of these scales are equal at minus 40. So we in the physics community think it's hilarious to say something like, Whoo, 
It's going to be so cold this winter, it's going to be minus 40. <clears throat> Fahrenheit or Celsius? No, we just laugh and laugh. We don't say the punchline because we know it's so funny. <laughs> Super cheesy. <laughs> That's us. So here is the scales again. Now it's showing absolute zero. Obviously, there's a big gap between absolute zero and freezing temperature of water. So absolute zero, <clears throat> this is to introduce the Kelvin scale. The Kelvin scale, because there is an absolute minimum kinetic energy, means there's an absolute minimum temperature. And so the Kelvin scale is devised so that zero Kelvins is absolute zero, the minimum possible temperature. For any other temperature scale, you just have to say, okay, let's shift it by X amount. So the Kelvin scale is shifted from Celsius by 273.15, or as you probably have learned elsewhere, temperature Kelvin equals temperature Celsius plus 273.15. So a change in one degree Celsius is the change, same as a change in one Kelvin. This is useful in physics. The standard unit for temperature is Kelvin. But if you're doing something that has a change in temperature, you can use Celsius or Kelvins. Because the change in 5 Celsius is the same as the change in 5 Kelvins. But if you're doing something where you multiply by temperature or divide by temperature, you must use Kelvins. So as a general rule, you're always safe to use Kelvins. But if it's a change in temperature, you can use Celsius. Notice the Fahrenheit scale absolute zero is minus 459.67. Now Fahrenheit doesn't want to be left out all in the cold, so there's also a Rankine scale that's based off of the Fahrenheit. So it's zero, and here would be 459.67, and then this would be 456. 71.67. That's how the Rankine scale works. As far as I know, no one uses the Rankine scale. You're never going to be asked a question about it. But it is interesting to know that there is a temperature scale that's an absolute scale for the Fahrenheit um, calibration as well. All right. Let us go to WUCLAP. Since Al or Andy's not here. Okay, so first question. It's open, yeah. Which statements are true about the Celsius temperature scale? And it's multiple answers. Not all of them. <laughs> No, in present tense. I mean, these don't count for great, but. Wait, so you're saying it's that's supposed to be like is? Is currently today. The first one was. So is the third one. Okay, we got seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Should have 12, so five of you. Got 10, 11, all but one. Well, we got all but one. I'll take that as a, as a win for now. Let's see what we answered. 91%, all but one, said it was developed by a Swede. Yes. Anders Celsius. That's only important to me because, you know, Swede. It is the centigrade scale. Six out of 11 said it is. It used 
to be a centigrade scale. Up until around 1954, when it changed to being a scale based on, actually, I said 99.99. It's 99.99 between boiling and the triple point, but they actually, now that I remember, didn't think about this, they went from absolute zero to the triple point. So it's actually 273.16 for its calibration points. I, I used to believe differently. So it's no longer centigrade scale. But it's still 100 degrees between boiling and freezing. Those just aren't the reference points anymore. So originally, zero was the temperature of boiling water. Absolutely. Originally, zero was the boiling temperature, and 100 was freezing temperature. Oh boy, two people said it's an absolute temperature scale. No. The Celsius scale has absolute zero minus 273.15. An absolute temperature scale has zero as absolute zero. That's what defines the absolute temperature scale. This one is the SI unit temperature. Technically, the SI unit temperature is the Kelvin. But because of the close relationship between Celsius and Kelvin, I simply wouldn't ask a question like this on the test because they're so similar. It's just the offset. A change in one degree Celsius is bigger than a change in one degree Fahrenheit? Yes, that was the last thing I talked about before the quiz. Because of that factor of five ninths, <clears throat> It only takes 100 degrees to go from zero to, well, from, well, it takes 100 degrees to go from zero to 100. I believe that. From freezing to boiling in Celsius, but it takes 180 steps, so smaller steps to do it in Fahrenheit. Any questions? No? All right, moving on. Temperature measurement. When we measured the temperature, for the little boy, when we saw the picture, he was putting one of these under his tongue. And what was happening was the alcohol gets warm, and what's it doing? It gets warm, expands. But there's other things. This here, for instance, I get to start my fire now. You know how it is for us physicists, we are fire. <laughs> you should have seen our Fourth of July celebrations in graduate school. We get a bunch of 23 year old. Nerds. Okay, why is it not? <laughs> okay. What was that? Okay, why is that? I actually was going to point that out, so that's a good thing. Everybody see this? What's happening with the flame? Okay, it's burning, which is an exothermic reaction. Releasing heat, I say releasing instead of producing, but we're all on the same page. And so the air and gas is hotter than the surrounding. What happens to the density of something when it heats up? It increases it, it well, it increases in volume, so it decreases in density. And what happens with the low density thing in a higher density medium? It floats. So we have this hot air floating up. And the speed of light is different in hot air than it is in cool air. And so the light that's coming through this is being bent around because of the temperature differences. You guys know the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Twinkling of stars is caused by the same effect. You have the starlight coming through the Earth's atmosphere, and you have different temperatures, and you have the motion of air with different temperatures, and so that causes the light to deviate around like this. So that's when you see a star twinkling, it's because where you're seeing the stars moving a little bit because of the different temperatures moving in the atmosphere. Okay, so here I have a piece of metal, and the front row people get all the fun. So, Olia, if you look at this, compare that side to this side. Do they look the same? No. What do you notice different about this side compared to that side? What? Color. This one here is a grayish color. This one here has a little bit of a copperish color. So it's two different types of metal. Because they're two different types of metal, the amount they expand when they heat up is going to be different. And so if one expands more than the other, then it does something like that. So it's all rolled up because it's hot. And as it cools, it unrolls. 
So if you look at a garden thermometer, you know, the kind that seems like it has this really big spring on it, and then it has an indicator, that really big spring is a die by metallic strip. It has two types of metal, one on one side, one on the other. And as it heats up, it curves more and they have the big coil because it doesn't have that much of a difference and so you have the big metal so it moves enough to move that indicator a significant amount. So that's another way of measuring temperature. I'm gonna turn this, of course I can do it again. I love doing this because, hey, I'm a physicist. Why do you think we go into physics, right? It's because of all the <laughs> Probably not good for us for someone who's ever done that. It didn't straighten out all the way, but you know, that's when you bend things. Okay, back to good. I don't have it up here, but this here is it's actually a demonstrator for um what's Boyle's law? I always just think of the ideal gas law and forget what the individual ones are. But this has a temperature gauge, so right now it's a little above 15. I let it equilibrate with the atmosphere. It actually should be a little bit below 15, but it's a little above. What's gonna happen to the pressure in this if I put it in the hot water? It's gonna what? Why would it increase? Because the cells atoms are more active, so they're hitting on the sides of the wall harder. So okay, the pressure is the force per area. If they're hitting the sides of the wall harder, they're going to put more force on it, so it should increase. So let's see if y'all are right. And sure enough, pressure goes up. Now, if I put this in cold water, what's going to happen? You'll relax. <laughs> I, I'm actually not going to just because I don't want to risk like potentially melting something. So it's gone down a little below 15 here. Not a lot because we weren't that far away. Yeah. I'm going to leave this burning because my next slide is going to have more of that. What about this other one here? Well, these other two. What things are going on with those two? Do you know? Just say yes if you know what's going on either one. Wait, what? Isn't that like weight sensibility? Well, the one that has the thermometer that is like the kind that you can put on your forehead, that's made out of polymers. And you have what's called photoreactive polymers. Everyone heard of a you heard of a mood ring, right? What does the mood ring do? It changes color, and it's supposed to tell you your mood as it changes color. But what it is is a photo photoreactive or whatever uh, polymer. The polymer changes color when you change temperature. And so when you are really cold, I think that's when it's black. And when you warm up, it moves across a range of colors. So that's what they have here. They have different regions, and they have it so the temperature is going to be, it's going to change colors in different temperatures in different regions. And that's how you determine temperature. The same technology is used for battery <laughs> testers. You see those battery testers where you press both sides and it turns green if it's good, it stays yellow if it's not? What's going on there is you have current that runs across the battery when you connect it, and it heats up the polymer. The better the battery is, the more it heats it up, it causes the change. If the battery doesn't produce much current, it doesn't cause the change. So that's that one. The last one here, this guy's not touching anything. He's just checking the temperature of air coming out of the vent. This is using electromagnetic waves. Light is an electromagnetic wave. That's one of the three mechanisms of heat. Waves. You are giving off waves because of your body temperature. And so if we were in some war-torn country and you were out there trying to snipe, we would look at you with our night vision goggles at night, and we could see your body's heat signature in the same fashion that he's using them. 
All right. Oh, what's the point of this? To allow a bridge to expand or contract because as temperature changes, the bridge material is gonna grow or shrink. And what you don't like is for your bridge to buckle because it expanded too much and didn't have enough space or to fall apart because it contracted and pulled apart. I don't know of any time where they didn't do that, but I'm not old, you know, I, I'm young still. So, <laughs> That's why I like to say at least. Five years ago. Five years ago. There was a bridge that did like collapse with that in the Um that was completely different. That was a structural the integrity of their trusses. When they had all the pieces out there for examination, I was up there to watch a Raider game, so I went and looked at the pieces like I could figure anything out. Um but yeah, that was completely different. These here are the equations that relate linear expansion and volumetric expansion. So this is our first equation, other than temperature um, definition equations, to tell us about how stuff changes. So the length of something will be L0, that's its length at your starting temperature times some constant that depends on the material is the coefficient of thermal expansion multiplied by the change in temperature. What restrictions do you have for change in temperature units? <clears throat> what units are good to use if you have a change in temperature? Celsius or Kelvin. Either one will work. Not Fahrenheit, no. We, we have our, our units of thermal expansion are usually in Celsius or Kelvins. And you'll, you'll look it up and it might say per degree Celsius. Or it might say per Kelvin. But since it's talking about a change, those are equivalent. It can be confusing when you have the, the alpha has per degree Kelvin and I said and it changes 5 degrees Celsius. Then you're like, well, Celsius over Kelvin, that's not 1. But a change Celsius over a change Kelvin is 1. So that's the length equation. The volume one is the same equation except for you replaced V or L with V and alpha with beta. Beta is approximately equal to three alpha. If you know alpha and you don't know beta, just use that. It's a ge geometry thing for isotropic materials, materials that grow the same in all directions. That's going to be true. Beta is the coefficient of volumetric thermal expansion. So, let's play some more physics. I have here a ball and a ring. The ball fits through the ring. Now I'm going to put the ball in the flame. What's happening to the ball as it's in the flame? It's expanding. Now, what direction is it expanding? Okay, out, everywhere, in all directions. If I measure the radius, the radius will increase according to that equation. So I heat it up a little, won't fit through anymore. How can I make it fit through? I can put it in the ice water, but I don't want to. Heat the thingy. Heat the thingy, the ring. What's going to happen to the metal when I heat the ring? It's, Depending on the going to expand, so the hole will get smaller, so it's still smaller. Okay. It seems that way, but that's wrong. It seems that way because you're like, well, if it was a bar like this, the bar would expand on both sides. But the way the expansion works is the hole expands as if it's made out of the material that is surrounding it. So if I heat this up with this, so I'm keeping them both in the flame now. Of course, I have to wait long enough for it to heat up. I can't just instantly do it. So you're saying it expands like what? The hole expands as if it's made out of the same material as the ring. All right, not yet. <laughs> yes. What you don't want to do is get it in there and have one cool quicker than the other somehow. There we go. So they both have to be in the flame at 
fire at the same time. Well, I, I no, I could take them out and do that. I was just making sure that this one stayed hot, so it's not like I'm cheating. Now, do it. <clears throat> that sound you heard is called quenching. That's very rapid um, expansion of the ice water because I put something hot, he transferred into it, it changed from gas or from liquid to gas, making that sound. Now it doesn't fit again. <clears throat> doesn't fit because I cooled this off. So keep it there long enough for it to at least stop making noise. Now it fits through again. So Max, you were right. I just didn't want to do it yet because I want to show the other thing first. So what did this illustrate? Expansion of volume and length. All right. Now, <laughs> here are some coefficients of thermal expansion. So here we have the linear ones, alpha, the volumetric ones. Whoops. Notice that it is per degree Celsius is what it says here. They could have said per Kelvin. So you'll find it both ways. And if you look there, you see that aluminum, for instance, expands a lot. Lead expands even more. Quartz doesn't expand much at all. What do we use for things like this? What kind of glass do we use? Um, it, it used to be Pyrex. Now they have, I think they call it Kim glass. The glass is something that's designed so it will have a very, very small coefficient of thermal expansion. So if you heat it or cool it, it doesn't change size very much. Why is that important? Well, if I <laughs> just had this happen last week, if I take a hot dish and I, or a cold dish and I put it in hot dish water, what's going to happen? Crack. Why does it crack? Because it went from a larger <laughs> size, quickly going down to a cool size, and so the substance Okay, you have it takes time for heat to go through the glass. Glass is not a good conductor of heat. So the whole thing was cold, so it was all small, contracted. And then I put it in the water, the outside expands rapidly while the inside is still cold and stays small. And so you have the same idea as we had with this bimetallic strip, because one side can expand more than the other. That would make a curve, or in the case of glass, fracture. Um, by the way, just for the record, Pyrex has been licensed by Corning to a couple different companies, and there is a real problem. The glass is not following the same low thermal expansion recipe, and people have been being injured by cooking things in Pyrex containers because it's no longer Corning's actual Pyrex. Okay, we are clearly not going to work out. This is just to illustrate that the hole grows. And I have this problem for overflowing of a gasoline can, but we don't have time to, to do that. So have a great day. I'll see you on Friday. Um, yes, there'll be homework.